The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. May I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I always find myself at a loss for words here in this liturgy on Palm Sunday. After hearing the entirety of the Passion narrative, one of the longer narrative portions that we get in the Gospels, the triumphal entry, the arrest and trial and execution of our Lord, you wonder after reading and hearing all of that, what is left to be said? We will choose over the upcoming week, Holy Week, together to reflect in greater detail on individual components of what we just heard, how our Lord gathered around the table with His disciples, their Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist, His agony in the garden, the betrayal, the trial, and His torturous death. It comes upon us with frightening speed. I was just saying in the sacristy this morning that it felt like it was just Christmas, and how are we already at Holy Week? And it rushes up on you through Lent, and the weeks go by like a whirlwind, especially here. But here, right now, in the middle of this liturgy, this is the silence before the storm, before everything hits, before we move into the full agony of Holy Week and the joy of Easter, we get this small reprieve. In the whirlwind of the events and the characters that we read through today, that we heard sung and uh, embodied, the whiplashed uh, fickleness of the crowd, the plotting and the scheming and the heartbreak, your focus in the narrative changes every few seconds. You're hopping from character to character to party to constituency and different people and different actions. And it can be tempting as you keep up and you follow the thread of the story to focus on all of the things done to Jesus. In fact, that's largely the core of our liturgical memory, what we do together, tracing the events that were set into motion, the sufferings that Jesus underwent. And this is good and has valuable precedent in the church, but it can be warped to an extreme, not here, not now, but elsewhere, so that the focus becomes exclusively on the physical horrors and agony that Jesus underwent during His passion. It's how I was raised to actually read these texts. I recall going with my church youth group when I was 13 to see the Passion of the Christ, and I remember sitting there and hearing a woman in hysterics behind me the entire film. And I walked out of that theater after seeing all of that violence and all of that pain, and I said to myself, I can never sin again, not after Jesus went through that. And maybe while it's well-intended, what lies beneath that feeling or that focus is the idea that my salvation comes through each strike of the whip, through each punch from a, a soldier, from each nail that's driven through, as if my salvation were dependent not on Christ, but on the brutality that humanity can inflict on itself, as if that's where the salvation comes from. What I'm trying to say is that what we risk in misplacing our focus on this story and thinking of Jesus as an object that things happened to, rather than seeing Jesus as a real person, is that we lose sight of the fact that in this story, the only person with total control and total agency is in fact Jesus. Read Isaiah's description again of the suffering servant, what Christians read as a messianic prophecy. I gave my back to be whipped. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. Jesus himself says it like this in John 10, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. Focus on that, and then go back to the beginning of the story that we started with today, the road into Jerusalem, the disciples procuring the donkey. 
Go back before the palms and the crowds, before the upper room and the garden and the trial and Golgotha. And as you walk back through the story again, through that narrative thread, just focus on the person of Jesus. Focus just on Jesus. Shut out Pilate, shut out the soldiers, shut out Judas, shut out the apostles that said they'd always be there but ended up running. Ignore all of that. Walk through the narrative again in your mind. Focus on Jesus and consider how many different opportunities Jesus had from entering into Jerusalem until his passion to simply not go through with it. To simply realize, as he knew, that the crowd was going to turn on him, that his disciples, for all their promises of fidelity and loyalty, would be there, that even the people he said he could trust the most would stand by him and not betray him. Jesus could have chosen time and time again to walk away, to simply not go through with it. So why does he? The author of Hebrews says it this way, we look to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and taking his seat at the right hand of God. For the sake of the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that made him take step after consecutive step to ride into the city to face everything that he knew he was going to encounter? Try to think, if you will, in order to understand this joy of people in your life who you love so dearly, you'd offer yourself in their place to prevent suffering from happening to them. If you have children of your own, you might think of it like that, or you think about your partner, your spouse, or a friend who is closer to you than any blood relative. Try to conjure in your heart right now, imagine that feeling of unthinking resolve, reflexive impulse to defend, to protect, to guard, an irrational disregard for your own safety and your own well-being. Imagine the depth of love and commitment you would have to feel in order to take such an action. And then think back to Jesus, just focusing on Him, and see what He came to show us clearly all along. A love that is so powerful that it chooses you time and time again, knowing that the world is going to throw everything it possibly can at Him, the most brutal impulses and darkest feelings towards the good and the different and the beautiful. We see a love in Jesus which bears everything we can throw at it, and yet it still faces, it sets its face like flint and rides on. Because in the end, the choice that Jesus kept making on the way into the city and on the way to the cross was you. You are the joy that was set before Jesus. You personally, not just collectively, individually, you are who Jesus had in mind. And you are why Jesus chose to brave the depths of our depravity and our brokenness so that we could have the possibility of new life. This is love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, this is not a reminder that is also a sort of backdoor browbeating, how fortunate it is that God would love a wretch like me, but rather the most hopeful of proclamations for a broken and scarred world. No matter the darkness, no matter when you are found in situations when nothing makes sense and you have no idea which end is up, no matter the emotional or physical or spiritual wounds that ail us, no matter the pain, no matter the rejection, Christ sees you clearly, loves you dearly, and offers him himself in brokenness on the cross and on the altar for you. He chooses rejection and being spurned so that you might find a home in his embrace. So as we venture through Holy Week together, cling to this love. Cling to the glory in broken places, the lights when all other lights go out. May it guide you through Monday Thursday, through Good Friday, and into the joy of Easter. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.